you've been um, a fireside chat. So you've been collaborating for uh, for a while. Actually, for how long have you been collaborating? Uh, several years, probably at least quite intensively since 18, 19, something like that. Yeah, our first uh, Tetra Pak production in Brazil was 1982. Uh, since, since that, we've been developing a lot uh, collaboration with Tetra Pak in many different aspects, especially related to the, say, to the increase of the paper quality and advancing in, in new products as Tetra was demanding that. So more than 40, 40 years already now. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay. Um, so uh, I'm gonna ask uh, maybe a couple of questions or or maybe just one, depending how much uh, uh, discussion there is. And then it would be great if, if you have some questions you want to ask, uh, please uh, let, us, let us have them then. Um, so my first question would be, now what is the role of, the, um, of a vision and a, and a common understanding for collaboration? And related to that, uh, now how to balance this, this vision and clear direction with the need in a partnership and an innovative partnership to be able to iterate and adapt and pivot uh, and so on uh, when there are changing circumstances. So the role of the vision and uh, how does this relate to the ability to adapt? This is how much we thought about this. You go first. <laughs> Okay, I think that the things are related, let's say, um, with the vision that we have inside both companies, especially when you do our strategic view and how this business can grow for the future and how sustainable they can be for, for the future, achieving all the goals that uh, are set for us, for the customers, for our final users, for the planet and for everything else. So we try to address that environment of uh, uh, what's going to, and to try to anticipate what will going to happen and then try to have a common agenda of uh, discussion. So these things are being done for many, many years already between Clavin and, and Tetra Pak, but it was especially related to the, say, to the paper development and the paper use. Mm. But so lately this uh, agenda uh, of uh, sustainability also came on place, and so we started this collaboration as see our greenhouse gas, gas uh, uh, GAG, greenhouse gases reduction, uh, also help, let's say, your performance on your product on the, on the carbon uh, balance and, and so on. And uh, in the, specifically now, uh, lately we also are trying to address uh, agenda on uh, innovation. So how, what else can we do? Try to help to improve the renewable contents on, uh, let's say, the final liquid packaging material. Yes, all right. I, you, you heard um, some of my presentation and you understood that a large part of it is about the removal of aluminium from the packaging material and increasing the fiber content uh, as much as possible. And I think the role of the vision there was incredibly important. So, um, you know, um, what we tried to do is to make sure that, I think the first time, that both of the executive management teams were completely bought into this. Right? So we didn't want lots of questions around that, but we also didn't want it too specific either. So we wanted to kind of, the vision also had to be a little bit of a framework. So there wasn't too much management buy-in to the specifics. And I think that was a very important thing because we've had to change tack quite a lot as we've been working. But we wanted to, the vision kind of gives the, the working team air cover. So uh, we can tell our senior management of uh, Tetra Pak and Glabin that we're working on kind of improving the sustainability of the structure but not to take it too much further, I think, you know, to allow people to really work independently. I don't know if that helps, but um, that has been a very important part of it, especially with our CEOs, to make sure that they, they have the same view. Huh? Yeah, okay. Um, any, uh, anybody wants to ask any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so that's the fireside, Jeff. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, <laughs> so it's will be better with a sausage, maybe, and a, a cup of uh, <laughs> wine, or maybe a glass of wine will be helping mm -hmm. people here to start talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, that's fun. Uh, so in an in an open innovation uh, uh, context, there's uh, there's a, an atmosphere, whatever it may be. What what is the 
how to create the right uh, chemistry, the right atmosphere for open innovation and, and also for, for transparency. Can I go first? Yeah. Um, look, uh, we've spoken a lot today about um, the importance of setting uh, KPIs and having contractual agreements in place, place, and maybe we can talk about those. But one of the things that really comes to mind is, as leaders in this space, sometimes when you've established a clear vision about what you want to do, I think our job is to just get out of the way, right? right? And allow people to explore and to experiment and to talk to each other as though, I think our team speaks with your team as though we are one company. Yeah. And we don't try and stick our fingers into that particular chemistry too much. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah but there is also a, a, some previous work that has to be done. Let's say yep. trying to address that and to then uh, make people feel feeling comfortable to talk to each other. So sometimes company has their own, uh, say, internal issues, secrecies, and so on that they would like to share. And uh, if you guys know the environment of R&D, especially, say, the old fellows, they are, they are quite, of, say, very close and uh, would, do not share that much with external uh, people. So our main task then was to create uh, a teamwork and how this team can uh, develop together. And so uh, they can have, let's say, clear views. Uh, what are the expectations that we set for the developments? And say, what are the, the goals we are trying to achieve? And also try to keep some, let's say, defining milestones or points that we're going to have to follow up to control a bit how the development is doing. But then also putting these guys together, uh, we managed to have, let's say, workshops between the teams, involve the main experts of uh, different areas of the company in things that we thought that will be nice to develop or nice to, to do for the sustainability point of view of, the com- of both companies. And sustaining, let's say, Tetra Pak's business is also sustaining Clavin's business because we're going to be keeping uh, supplying uh, the paper they, they're going to need. So uh, creating that atmosphere is, is not an easy way. Sometimes it takes a while for people to get along together and to understand it because uh, even being partners for many, many years, there are many different people, many different areas that uh, we do not uh, achieve or, or I'd say, uh, let's say addressing inside uh, Tetra Pak, or also Tetra Pak do not know much about uh, what our developments in in fibers, in products, in other yeah. things that are were done inside. So the way was then to create that atmosphere, to put in people uh, together and, and to discuss. We invested um, a lot of time understanding each other's intellectual property, I think. And uh, we did a really extensive mapping exercise about who owns what before they start. Yeah. And then um, we spent a lot of time really trying to understand um, who was going to take what share of intellectual property. So you were kind of putting ourselves in the end point and imagining what that was going to look like. Uh, that was a really, really helpful exercise to do. And I think, uh, Helen, you mentioned it this morning. It was, we kind of built that framework and then we put that within a legal framework as well. So, so individual projects could start and spin out or stop or change direction and they didn't have to keep coming back and asking for guidance. I think that was a really good investment, you know? Yeah, yeah took a bit longer on that with all the legal departments involved and then yes. sometimes we have to, to work hard on that with the, these guys trying to address, uh, say, specific issues. But it was important then to understand what was the, the background that both companies were bringing to that and also trying to anticipate what will be the foreground, what will be the result of uh, uh, the collaborations we are developing uh, together. And that is a special sometimes a tricky issue uh, when you need to use uh, third parties together to help you in some of the developments. You know? Sometimes you create also expectations to another supplier, because they are saying, oh, okay, there's a huge opportunity on the Tetra Pak business or on the business. So these guys also can be quite excited sometimes, and sometimes playing tough also with you and uh, the expectations for the future. So as much as you keep involving other people, uh, things are, are, are going to be a bit, let's say, difficult to handle, but. Uh, creating these things of uh, a common view, a clear uh, setting of, uh, of the rules, I think, um, uh, I think Michael mentioned that yesterday here in his presentation, uh, creating what are the expectations and the views, so you then define, a, it's a, a very 
uh, easy uh, ground to the development and let things happen. You know? Right. And do you have another question? Because it, it, it led somewhere. It led somewhere as well. I think that we quickly realised that um, not only do we need uh, um, a common framework, uh, like a, a legal framework, and you need common mapping of the intellectual property, and you need kind of clear goals, right? At least targets. You need to set people where you want to get to on the horizon in a certain period of time. But I, I, I think we did something else. I think we quickly realised early on that. Um, there was probably going to be need for common investment. And uh, we, we, we'd already put that on the table right in the beginning, that we were, we were prepared to do that. We were prepared to look at that from an expenses perspective. We were prepared to invest maybe even if it comes to CapEx, just so it left all options on the table very early. And sometimes you play a little bit cagey. I know what it's like in R&D. You play a little bit cagey. You, you, you don't want to really talk about those things because you want to minimize the amount of money you're spending right up front. In this case, I think we did it in a very transparent way, which was to say, hey, let's put every, all options on the table. And that was uh, really helpful, I think. And you can be transparent with each other. Yeah. It's the famous what if. What if this thing succeeds? Yeah. How can we implement? How can we scale up that quite fast? Because then there is a, this opportunity when you see uh, and how to go to market fast, because this is a, a really be something that is important for for the developments, for the goals, and say, and the clear view of uh, different programs and different projects that uh, we may be running together. Yeah. I mean, you said, somebody said it this morning, you know, um, uh, to, I think you said it this morning, sometimes eventually you've just got to put your money where your uh, mouth is, right? And be prepared to uh, um, uh, spend against it. And that's a really difficult thing to get to, actually, at that point. You know? to say you're going to commit even before you've done it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so there's a need to, um, to set the right uh, atmosphere for the teamwork, uh, to also uh, create the boundaries, the rules, and ensure that there's the thing about IPR is dealt with. And perhaps the moment you've really dealt with that, it's easier to be open because you know what the rules are. So yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And you were saying, you know, your role is initially, and then to get out of the way. You've got to get out of the way. <laughs> uh, yeah. And are there situations, and if so, which, uh, where you then have to step in again? And yeah, what would those be, situations be? We, we, we manage that quite formally, right? So, uh, you know, we, we, believe it or not, we don't have that many steering groups, actually, yeah. not that many, but we meet probably only a couple of times a year. There's not a huge amount of pre-alignment uh, for that meeting. But then sometimes, you know, we have to kind of steer things in a different, in a slightly different direction. And it's largely based around technical success, I would say, right? Yeah, I, I think that uh, we, we created, as I say, we have a kind of PMO from both sides following the project, what's going on. They do technical reviews quite fast, yeah. quite often. And then uh, every now and then uh, uh, we're going to... By the way, we're going to have a meeting Friday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, about what, uh, what's, what's going on in developments. But uh, sometimes we are also impacted by uh, other developments, other requirements from the market, other requirements from the, the, the say, the, the customers and so on. And sometimes you have to adjust the project or delay this part a bit and try to focus much more on, on some important parts that are, say, you, we saw a lot of these things happening now with these new regulations coming. So. How, how that can impact the, the project. So we are always trying to, to have the big picture and say, well, what's the strategic view, what is gonna happen, and try to address them uh, on the tactic level. And then uh, let the, the people do, do the work or how to, to move a bit the priorities of that. And, uh, and sometimes uh, you develop faster in one area, the others are requiring much more attention. And then you need to implement something though. So, but it's, not, it's good that we uh, keep following that because it's uh, nice also for the teams that they see the view of the top management and yeah. where the, we want to uh, go, uh, where we have to adjust to. Yeah, exactly. And we, we make sure within um, um, Tetra Pak that you know, our, all of our senior management understand that relationship. So it's not just you know, CTO or technical people speaking to the technical community. You know, um, our chief executive, you know, our head of a packaging division, you know, our CFO, uh, uh, we all try and have the same view so we can all tell our teams. Because sometimes that's where it falls apart. Somebody mentioned that it's sometimes more difficult to innovate internally in a company than it is externally. I think that's because often from the executive team and down, not everybody has the same view on the value of the relationship. 
and the value that you're going to get out of it in the end. We've worked really hard on that, so people really understand uh, uh, that you know this is important to us. Huh? And then they put their best people on it, and that's always a measure of success, right? If your best people are working on it, yeah. you can then be sure that you you've got something special, right? If it's not the best people, you need to know where your experts are and, and, yeah. and how to move these guys to the yeah. right project. Got it. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, so I heard the, the role of uh, getting the contract right, uh, and it can take a little bit of time initially, uh, but that can set the stage. Um, but, but how do you do it? So, so how do you um, contract and, and ensure uh, the right approach to IPR and CapEx uh, uh, as a whole? We, we, we developed together a kind of framework uh, of developments that the, both companies were doing and the work that we are doing together. So we put all the basic rules there and the basic principles, uh, what's going to happen if these things happen, if the other things happen, and so on. Uh, took longer for this, uh, that discussion, as uh, Lawrence already mentioned. But I think uh, at the end, we are uh, seeing that we do not have to, have to discuss uh, uh, all the details uh, in every new project that we are launching. So in the beginning, we create this, uh, let's say, common ground of understanding. And then for specific products, then we just discuss minor issues where there is something new to address. I think within, um, within Tetra Pak, one of the biggest things to overcome was that we, we came off a history of, to be blunt, getting as much as you can out of the relationships as possible. Right? So, and we, we were quite internally focused. And uh, um, I don't think the people in our legal and IPR teams would mind me saying that um, we come from a history of a lot of risk aversion and uh, it was very difficult to, um, uh, up until quite recently to create the right mindset there which is even when people are doing the patent mapping and when they're understanding what the various intellectual property fields look like they can normally start that from a perspective of what am I going to lose and we tried to turn that around a little bit you know, to, to create a, what are we going to get out of this if we get it right it's quite hard to overcome that uh, risk aversion, uh, but with a bit of practice, and I think we signed something like 50 partnership agreements in 2019, 2020, something like that. We kind of got there. We got to this point where now people are more interested about what we can get out of it than protecting what we've got. Right. Yeah, and this is a, a, a mindset changing inside the organization. So the organization was very close. It's, it's not still very recent, I can say about five, six years ago, things are starting to move fast, especially if the whole innovation agenda that we are seeing, all these expectations that we are, we are creating in the, in the environment of these uh, startup companies or the technology side. So uh, th these things are helping also change inside the, the companies. And the, the companies now are figuring out that uh, we can uh, develop, we can create with uh, what we call co-creation or development with the markets, with others, using other ideas. So it's just not the smart brains that we have inside the company, but there are many, many others that can contribute for the developments. So uh, that, that sort of thing is really helping to improve for everybody. I think it was the same inside Clubin and inside uh, Tetra Pak. Any questions from anybody? Um, so it's hot in front of the fire <laughs> we can see a little fire burning here it's a very disconcerting thing i can tell you <laughs> um yeah so um uh so then uh, i'll have one more question and then we can have one answer from from each uh and that is in the supplier customer relationship so how do you uh separate your innovation agenda from, from daily business? Yeah, that's quite a good question, actually. I think it's really important. I think if you maintain that traditional kind of uh, uh, customer-supplier relationship, I don't think that is a particular recipe for success. It's unbalanced. And we try and keep it a little bit separate from operations, right? So uh, not always possible, but we try and, we try and do that. There's a mutual dependency. It's really simple. Yeah, usually you have that, uh, let's say, 
a wall inside the company that you are always connecting to the say the, the procurement team to the supply uh, team. And uh, when you, you can break that wall and you achieve, let's say, the uh, innovation departments or the R&D departments directly, and people start to talk the language they already know because these guys are developers, no? Uh, these things start to be fast, but then you, you separate a bit. But there is always this expectation of say, okay, if these products come to the market, how are going to be the price, how will be the cost, how will be the margin that you guys are going to be uh, using for this co-creation of co-development. So uh, there is always the participation of this, the guys on the day-to-day -day business. But I think more and more is starting with the, let's say, the trust that we are creating, with, even inside that department, uh, we are now trying to, let's say, exchange much more information and the relationship. And also, uh, then we have to discuss a bit later maybe the opportunities on the business side. Too. <laughs> So, uh, very brief, um, uh, one sh very, very short answer. Uh, now, you both had um, a, an evolution in terms of uh, the companies being more open to collaboration. Uh, what are the, the key things that, um, or a key thing that made the difference, how to accelerate that shift to being open? I can take it from our perspective. I mean, you know, we, we realized that if we didn't do things in a completely different way, we would never move at the pace of change that was going on in the outside world. So ours was probably being a bit more hyper aware of what was happening around us and just seeing the pace of that. Honestly, it created a real sense of urgency and panic. And, uh, and there's plenty of great examples about how you can then do this and uh, it was, we had to quickly embrace that mindset. Yeah. Yeah, I think I fully agree. Uh, it was, uh, what comes to my mind immediately, the sense was sense of urgency. Sense of urgency, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, and I have a sense of urgency that we need to go to the uh, discussions now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, so thanks a lot for, uh, for joining the discussion. I appreciate it. Thank you.